It's Saturday, March 30th, 2024, and you're listening to episode 621 of Fear the Boot, the show about tabletop role-playing games and a little bit more. Running time for this episode is 49 minutes. Welcome to Fear the Boot. My name is Dan. This is Nuri. This is Wayne. And this is Caleb. So last episode, we talked about technology and gaming and I said I was hoping to do a two-parter where we would come back and defend technology and gaming and state the other side of the argument. And fortunately, we were able to get Caleb because while we all have some experience merging technology into our games, Caleb, you've taken it to a whole new level. So do you want to talk about your setup real quick before I introduce the topic? Sure, sure. Um, some of you got to see it a little bit of it at Fear of the Con this year. I brought a tabletop TV into my game. I've been playing with D&D for many, many years and other types of tabletop games, and I got tired of drawing on a mat. Yeah. You know, or printing out you know maps that I never get to use because the players go left instead of going right. And I found people were inserting these into their tables and doing all these cool things. And I was like, oh, that looks really neat. And it would save me the time of having to come up with a map on the fly. So I, instead of getting all crazy and fancy, I just lay the TV on top of the table. And then I place a, it's got a plastic sheet, essentially like a screen protector over it. And then I just lay the minis directly on top of that TV. I can place assets on the screen. I can place details, different props. But because I'm doing it with a very lightweight tool, I don't have to pull out a huge map or stop the game in the middle of it, clear everything off to put a big mat out or get a bunch of minis out. I have my minis set to the side, ready to go at any point, and then I just plop them onto the new map. Even what though- tool do you use? Sure. Uh, I use Owlbear Rodeo right now. Owlbear Rodeo. Okay, I'll, I'll leave <laughs> that in the like, show notes. <laughs> yeah, we'll leave it in the show notes. Those were not words I was expecting. Okay, uh, Owlbear Rodeo. It is one of the popular ones right now. Okay, yes. fair enough. Okay. I just started, you know, fair uh, So I looked at the probably, what, five or six main forms of them out there, and I was really shocked at how much CPU power was used just to maintain those things. Yeah. And I wanted something I could run on my laptop run directly on the screen, not have to spend a ton of money on it. I didn't want to spend hundreds of dollars on this setup and then find out I hate it. So I was looking at different options. I played around with an open source one that worked okay, but it kept running out of resources very quickly. No matter how much I would throw at it, it was eating resources. And I was having to have a full PC to run it, whereas I didn't want that. I wanted it to be lightweight, not thought about, and for the not hearing a fan noise constantly because it kicked up the GPU to high speed just because I'm trying to run a screen. And Owlbear runs in a web browser, oh, and it can oh, run okay. off of your phone. Like, it is super lightweight, super easy to work with. The people I know that have mm-hmm. raved about it, that's the number one thing they all say is that compared to a lot of the others, it just works. It's mm-hmm. simple. And it has far less overhead for them to set things up than some of them, like, say, Foundry. Oh, yeah. yeah. Is that where you make your maps as well? Or do you use something like Ark and Forge? Or... Yeah, I use other tools. I have to be honest with you, I steal a lot of maps um, okay. I, from people well, who have posted them for free. Yeah, yeah. Like, uh, you know, <laughs> not, not stealing with the, permission not is, stealing, you know, But I mean, it, and the way you call it there. But I go to Reddit and things like that and pull the maps that I need. I've pulled hundreds and hundreds of maps. And I keep a log of where I get them from so that right. I, you know, for credits. But yeah, like, for example, you know. when I was running an online D&D game, yeah. I joined a Reddit where everybody just shares their maps. Mm-hmm. And it's all throughout the day. People are sharing different maps for things. So you go into that Reddit and then you search just within that Reddit for mm-hmm. a key term. And you get back all the posts where people have done a ship, for example, yep. or a campground. And I did a lot. I've looked into like Incarnate and some other other tools that you can create your own maps. But as long as I have can find something that's already existing, then I don't have to spend four hours making it. That's what I prefer to do. And I keep a large catalog of maps that are easy to grab quickly. And I've got to, you know, organized a little bit so that I can find them quickly. And Outbearer does a pretty decent job of organizing uh, by type. I can tag things and label things. So if I needed to pull out a, a cave with lava in it, I could have it tagged cave and lava and be able to find it in two seconds. Yeah, I say even as someone, I am not a map person. I am not a mini person. Mm-hmm. But seeing your setup at Fear the Con, walking up to the table and seeing the like the deck of a ship and the minis were mm-hmm. on there and all of the players looking at it, and you could walk around the different angles. Because I would expect when I saw everything set up that you were just going to have tokens on there you were moving around. Mm-hmm. But they still had the tactical moving things. Mm-hmm. And just visually, it looked beautiful. 
Oh, yeah. I was seriously impressed by it, and I don't like maps or minis. Yeah, <laughs> yeah. And, of course, technology doesn't just have to be on the maps or minis side. One of the things I was thinking back to was several years back at one of our conventions, I ran a Lion King sing-along game. Sure. Where there was no electronic map. Mm -hmm. So the tabletop itself was very low-tech. In fact, I just found a gridded foam play mat. Mm -hmm. And when I say play mat, I mean like you'd let a toddler play on. and it's, Like with it's, the puzzle squares? Yeah. So, I mean, those looked like spaces. Yeah. And then people played stuffed animals that represented the animal they were playing. And they'd move them around that board. And whenever we got to a musical number, Julia brought a karaoke set up. Oh, yeah. And everyone had to sing the song. And there were, of course, usually all these secondary rules that would go with how they sang the song. And they'd have to change certain lyrics. And otherwise, it'd screw with their character. And anyway. Yeah. The closest I've done is when running Ghostbusters, a lot of times I will load a phone app that has all of the sound effects. Oh, yeah. So when they talk about loading up in the uh, their version of ecto 23 or whatever it is i'll hit the uh, the sound and have the alarms going as they're on there yeah. and you know a few little things like that is the extent that i've done but i quit doing them at conventions because you can't hear it all right so let's <laughs> start with the most obvious benefit of using technology in a game, which is the better availability and access to players. Because you can now play, assuming you can make your schedules line up, mm -hmm. with anyone anywhere on the globe who's got an internet connection. It doesn't matter where the people are, whether they can make it. They don't have to drive anywhere. If they've got a kid, they need to kind of watch at home, but they can half pay attention. Eh, okay, maybe not a great gaming habit, but you can at least make that work. So, I mean, you don't even need players at all. You take this to its far extreme. For anyone who didn't know this, you can run or play a role-playing game with ChatGPT. Sure. And I tested that before this recording just because I wanted to confirm that I was right in my memory, and I am. But I had it do two games. One where I said, okay, I want you to run a game for me, and this is what I'm playing. And it started running a game for me. Mm -hmm. And then I did the opposite one. I said, I want to run a game for you. This is what you're playing. <laughs> and it started telling me its actions. And so oh, yeah. we, I was able to run a role. But there was not another human being involved. But I was, in a weird sort of way, sort of socializing. <laughs> I mean, it's not the same as a true solo game, right? It's like, a, I guess I'll call it a 1.5 player game. I, yep. I don't know how to. Yeah. Uh, it's me and a system, a computer system, it I mean. It depends on where it's you... It's an extra uh, input, but yeah, yeah it's not yeah. an extra person. Yeah, it's not a person, but it was nonetheless using what we'll call imagination and creativity. Are and... your players really people anyway? I mean, it depends on... <laughs> what is a person? Uh, <laughs> that gets into a whole other topic. <laughs> so I think that right there is going to be my first point in favor of is yeah. the immediate access to anyone, and that makes it easier for the players to participate, makes it easier for you to find the types of players you mm. want or the types of GM you want. You're fishing for much deeper waters, and the burden on the participants is lower for the same reason working from home is a lower burden on employees. I mean, even yeah. even my, uh, my other gaming group, we were in person for forever, but our game master lived in Festus, which is about a 45-minute drive mm -hmm. from St. Louis. And that was a physical drive every week. And then, you know, shutdowns and COVID and everything else, and we started playing remotely, and it was like... Oh, well, now we don't have to drive 45 minutes every week, so we have more game time. And so we yeah. just have kept doing that. Well, and there's a lot to be said for that and being able to find, play with people you wouldn't be able to otherwise, find people interested in your type of game that wouldn't. But we did on the last episode, we tried to avoid talking about online strictly yeah. because we right. wanted to stick with the idea of using the technology, technology at a physical the table. table. Yeah. Mm -hmm. But right before we started recording, Caleb, you were mentioning that you've used it as a way to have specific players that might miss a session mm -hmm. join in. Absolutely. I, I've got a couple of times where now that I've got this uh, virtual tabletop built into my existing normal play, I, and I do use tokens for those cases occasionally, mostly so they can tell me where they're going and where the min enemies are. It allows that other player to be able to be at the location's and see everything that the other players are seeing, other than the faces and, and whatnot. It's, you know, facial expressions don't quite get carried over. But he can at least join in and not be completely missing on a, and I don't have to run his character or have one of the other players run his character in a vital scene. 
or a vital uh, combat or something of that sort, especially with something like 5e or whatever, where you're running a D&D game, missing a character can mean you lost out on your guy who can cast fireball right. or, or you know, somebody else has you know, to play vital that tool. Who right. has to make the rules without yeah. understanding the rules of that character class all the yeah. way. I will say I've had players before ask when they were traveling, could they just call into a game? And I've always said no, because I don't like that idea of everyone is physical except for the one person that's mm-hmm. there. Well, and because yeah. it feels like it feels disjointed. Yeah. And like I said, I have we, like in a conversation before I've played whole games where it was set up around the concept of everybody is here except one person is remote. And it is very frustrating. And I had not thought about using it as specifically a tool just to facilitate somebody being still in the background, but just having that little bit of participation that they can give. Right. Because that is the thing that it distances. Yeah, you. I think that's the route I'd have to go to, Mary, is, is saying that if someone can't make it, we're going to give them a sort of half role that if you're not here you're going to sort of participate and you can still see what's going on because of the use of these streaming services and whatnot but i don't think that i would want to game with four people in max headroom no, okay. I mean, there, there is still a disconnect the whole there. turn all, turn around a laptop with the webcam yeah. on. Yeah. And, Again, and it, it's hard for that person on the other end of that computer to participate in, in, in the table in an yeah. equal way. Yeah. So the, yeah, I've so. seen that in just meetings at work. It never works if you have everybody physically at the table except for one person that's virtual or the other way around, where everybody except for one or two people are virtual. It has to be all one or the other for me. It works okay if that person is the spotlight 100%. Like they're the presenter or something of that sort, but not in the reverse where they're the spotlight, you know, the partial spotlights. They're either going to be completely in the background, like a ghost almost, of their main character, and they're not going to be the spotlight that game. And then the other players play the spotlight. They're just there to uh, participate, but not really be the kind of side character. And I think that works really well to encourage that person to show up the next game, in my opinion, because those people will feel like they're still engaged. They don't feel disconnected completely. They haven't missed everything. They haven't missed everything, but then they're like, okay, that wasn't my favorite experience. Yeah. And, and if it is, maybe you need to find a different game, right? There are plenty of online games. But in my experience, it's worked really well to get that person to come back to the table. If you're sick, you know, you can't uh, join in, but you're still well enough to hang out and engage with the game. It would be nice if you had that one player at your table and you're talking ahead of time and they're complaining about their kid being sick to be able to tell them, why don't you just stay home and not bring your germs to the yeah. table? Yeah. Because yeah. you're yeah. going to get the rest of us sick. Even if you feel fine, you're right. carrying it. <laughs> and it doesn't penalize them completely like it's not a, it's a very valid option now there's some challenge to that and you have to encourage the other players to engage with that player in a different way so that they don't feel like they're completely just sitting there off on their own and you have to make sure that they're you're calling out to that character for different points or when it would be appropriate obviously they aren't going to be the spotlight but you're going to get attentional action from them so that they're not just sitting there quiet and not doing anything or falling asleep. I unfortunately have also encountered the person who would have to be encouraged out of staying there. Sure. Like where yeah. they're like, this is easy and I'm not in the spotlight and I can just sit here and like half pay attention. And can I just keep doing this? And it's like, no, no, I need yeah. you to not do that. And while I realize I did kind of mention it in setting up the advantages of online gaming, like when I said this really isn't supposed to be about online right, yeah. games. But having said that, just as an aside, I think my struggle with a true online game or even allowing players to be online without some kind of a spanking in there, you know, like a reduced role like you were talking yeah, about, yeah. is it either becomes too easy or too comfortable not to show up. And so that person is always playing the game at arm's length, always partially disconnected. And I've also found it creates another issue, which is that sometimes the technology Technology or the things going on in the background around them or whatever mm-hmm. becomes more interesting than the game or at least it has the potential to so once again if you have four people and then an absentee who's coming in as max headroom over a laptop yep then if they're walking through a kitchen or something and something's cooking you know someone like chad's gonna ask about what's being cooked right, yeah, right. and i could do this with any of us they walk past the right thing and somebody's gonna ask about it or talk about it or if the people happen to know the significant other or the kids then right and so you have a whole new area of distraction how cool would it be though if you could work it into the plot let's say you're running a sci-fi game and you've got one person that is your decker in a shadow run game 
Mind you, I've never played Shadowrun. No, nothing, nothing about it. <laughs> but I know the Decker is a, basically the hacker. You could do it with the Decker contact, maybe yeah, not yeah, a right. true player character. Something like that, though. If you were play, if you had one character at the table that you knew wasn't going to be able to physically be there for that one session, you could somehow work it in where they are not with the party, but they're communicating. So you actually could make their being in only over video or its voice part of the story yeah, for that week. it seems like I think that would be a gimmick that would grow old pretty quickly, though. Because, like, you could do it for one game right. and say, okay, this person's going to be the AI or the hacker or somebody's familiar. Explain through the setup right. why they're less present than everyone else. But I think that would get pretty tiring one game after another. Yeah, after if another. it's a repeat thing, it definitely would. I am all for some fun gimmick to explain why a certain character's not there. Yeah. Sure. Or why something's different for a session. I love playing into those. It's, it's one of those where if you acknowledge it and make it part of it, it becomes less of a distraction or a, or a detraction from exactly. the experience. And you do that regularly on, at least we have in the past, with the character not being there. Why is that character not there? I've also seen it. I've been listening through the Critical Role series just because I haven't ever paid attention to them until recently. And they do the exact same thing with a couple of characters who had to work out of town. One of the main characters was a, was a, uh, a paladin-style holy character. And her character would be brought in virtually through an audio. And would they would um, call that out as uh, the god was bringing their spectral form to show up. And so if they had internet issues, which they were back then, this is five, ten years ago, they were still dealing with that kind of stuff, even at their level. Would she disconnect it? Oh, the, you know, the god has pulled, you know, there's some reason reason why the god cannot bring your spectral person here at this moment right um and they played with it now again it was distracting at times even for their level of you know like intentional showmanship it was created distractions even to their team in my games i found it works better because technology is a little bit better uh level and i'm I'm an IT guy, so this is what I do. So I make sure that my stuff is at a point where everything's on hardwire, you know, all those kind of things are already placed. But I make sure that the other players also have that kind of level of technology before I even allow them to work from home. You hit on the big you hit on the big word for me that is why I struggle with this. Mm -hmm. Why I don't do it, I don't bring technology to the table. Because as a player, every time a GM has tried to do it at a physical table, bring technology in, bring in slideshows or sure. music or anything. Every single time it's been a distraction. And I completely understand that. I agree with you that I've seen that done terribly and I've seen it done wonderfully. And I am very, very careful about how I bring in my technology that I not only played with it ahead of time, but I've tested it heavily before I bring it to the table in the situation and the layout that, you know, I would be running it in. Yeah. One huge advantage of the way you've described for me would be you know, a lot of times I will print something ahead of time and bring it and have it ready to go to show them if I need it. Mm -hmm. Let's say it's the layout of a building that they're, yeah. I know they're probably going to go in. It would be handy instead of having a printout to be able to just have a folder with all of this stuff. And, you know, yeah. if something comes up, yeah. Yeah. bring it up. I, and I think that's, that. yeah, a, that's a, yeah, that's a huge plus for this is moving away from really most of the stuff we've talked about thus far is really about access to the game. You know, if you're absent sure. or something yeah. like that. So let's move past that to the quality of the game or the experience of gaming. And Wayne, I, your point right there is exactly what I had as my next point as well, which is what I'm going to call the uh, cash and clutter savings. Yep. <laughs> that if you need a new map or a picture or a sound file or whatever, you don't have to present these things physically. Correct. You don't have to show up to a game with some 50 pound bag of papers and books and references and minis and all this other crap. And then have to dig through it yeah. physically yeah. because and then, you can't control it. And then F the battle's the about to break out. Yeah, and it takes an hour and a half to find all the stuff and yeah. set it up. Oh, that's the big one for me. I'll have my binder full of things yeah. and I have to sort through the papers to find yeah. the right one. Mm -hmm. When, for example, at one of my last sessions I ran, I was trying to describe a golden Sumerian ritual dagger. Yep. Mm -hmm. I don't think visually. So I'm not particularly good at describing visual. So what I did was I did a quick Google search on my phone and brought up a picture of what I was trying to tell them about. 
knowing that I was going to have the technology at the table, I would have had that already in a folder. Well, and that's even even as simple as having uh, digital rule books. And again, this is a game I'm playing online, yeah. but like having the PDF of the rule book, mm-hmm. control F is my yes. friend. Like if I'm looking for a specific rule, it's way easier to go search for experience point costs. Here's the experience points cost. I didn't spend five minutes looking through which book I needed and how long to find I it. I have stacks of bookmarks of tables and generators and, you know, rule information that I can pull up in milliseconds, you know, versus searching for it in my books. Because even though I may know where it is in, you know, the monster manual or whatever I'm looking at, it still takes me a minute to get, you know, I know it's around 190. It's still going to take me a minute to flip to 190 and then make sure I'm on the right spot, right? And I also use the same thing for images like you were talking about. I'll describe the creatures that they're going to fight or whatever. But if they're not getting it, I immediately grab an image and I drag and drop it onto my virtual tabletop and it's that quick. And I have a full HD image of what that creature looks like. And it's not something you have to pass around the table yeah. or pan for everybody to see. Or try see. to hold it up and not show the stats. Yeah. Yeah. You know, <laughs> I'm hiding the stats, but I want to show you the picture. Digital um, rule books are huge because not yeah. only just in one book. So, for example... I run Dresden Files. There are three physical books that Mm -hmm. I will have at the table. And I will frequently go to the newest book because it has the most updated index to look through the index to figure out which of the three books this is in. Mm -hmm. Where I could have all three of them open in different tabs and do Mm -hmm. a quick search or... The way I tend to do my searches, I could do find in file across mm-hmm. yeah. all three. If the yeah. previous one was cache and clutter, this is sort and search. Yeah. yeah. That yeah. is so much easier to sort and search digital data than it is physical data. Yeah. I mean, Wayne, what you're describing is something that they did back in older versions of D&D. I don't think they still do it as best I recall my 5e books, where in the back of the books, the index would typically use a different font to refer to pages of certain books. Mm -hmm. So it'd be like, you want to look this up. Well, it's page 151 through 153 of the player's handbook. Or here's a number in bold. That's where it's mentioned in the DM's guide. And here's one in italics. This is where it's mentioned in some supplement book. Mm -hmm. And they would have these cross-book indices. And obviously, nowadays, with PDFs, OneNote, whatever it is you're choosing to use, it's so much easier to search these documents, to enter link them it's one of the things i'm grateful for with dresden files there's only three books and they have a two to three character name description for the book oh, that yeah. they put before the page number yeah there you so go. you know exactly which of the three books it's in yeah but you have to go to the newest book because the first two were published before that one so, so it's like you might not find it in the index right. if you're looking at the early book and while it is possible to know a system well enough to be able to have someone say, hey, I need to know where this is, and I you know, can say it's in the DMG on page 274, that's one game, and it takes a lot to yeah. learn that one game. And you don't need to do that yeah. with this. I don't have to frequently reference the book at the table, but if I do have to reference it, it's because something is going on right now that I need that information for. Yeah, It's never because I might need that. No, it's because... Something just came up that I didn't expect, yeah. and now I'm going to either wing it, which is what I tend to do, mm-hmm. or I'm going to start looking through the book. And I'm more likely to look through the book if I have it in a PDF I can quickly search. But even even as a player, there are systems where I'm, I'm one of those people who I'm like, I want to know what the rule is. I know the DM has made his ruling, and it's fine. Yeah. I'm going to go with it. But for my future reference, I want to know. And it's just so yeah. much quicker, to even even as a player, to look things up and be able to help like if the DM can't figure it out fast mm-hmm. enough and hasn't hasn't improv something, it's like, okay, here's the information. Like I can look it up as fast as you can. And I use it as a DM to pull up rules that are, you know, unusual ones. Like, you know, your grapple rules and stuff that I don't ever look at or nobody ever remembers. Or the character doesn't remember what their spell does. You know, yes, they understand the basics, but if I need to do a detail on it, mm-hmm. I'm pulling it up online really quickly. Yeah. Or if there's a question on the rule that I can easily quickly do a Google search and get a Reddit feed that tells me this is how you would arbitrate in this situation. I can always do it myself, but to give them a valid rule to go off of, I can pull it up in two seconds rather than flip through the book. Well, it's on this reference. Is it really this way? And then you have to flip to another page and it's really talking about it this way. I um, love so. making myself cheat sheets for... yeah. Not just for rules, but for information about the characters. So I like to know what are my characters' stats, 
the player characters, what are their stats, what are their NPCs, things like that. And right now I make an Excel file and I print it, or I make something in OneNote and I print it. And then when it comes time, I have to go through my sheets real quick. I might have it in a notebook. If I were doing digital, I would have an Excel spreadsheet and I would have links to it. So on the front page, I click on it, it takes me to the tab I want with the information I want. Yep. I use, uh, there's a couple of digital DM screens that are out there that you can use it as a, it's a web page and you can build it out and frame it out however you want it. So what you see is what you get kind of editor and you build out your character sheets or whatever for the game you're playing. And it actually has all, you could bring in what information you want, just like you would for an old DM screen, except the DM screens where what you get is what you get, you know, yeah. what you bought mm-hmm. is what you get this. You get to like, okay, I don't care about what the stats mean because I know what those are, the stat categories. But I might care about the grapple rules that I never look at until I need it, yeah. right? So I can bring in those kind of quick reference guides. And then I have links off of, you know, a bookmark list to different reference guides that I need if I need it. Yeah, and the- personalization of the experience is another right. benefit to technology. Because, like, I'm sitting next to, this is what, a Shadowrun, I don't know, 5th edition, something, I don't know. Yeah, it's yeah. Catalyst, so it's worth Yeah, I have no idea what it is, <laughs> to be honest. <laughs> But this book right here, which, of course, is not all I mean, as big, but I guess it's not like uncarryably big. But everything in this book is what is needed for any group of players to play this game. Now, what if I'm playing a game where no one's a Decker? Right. Well, all those rules are just wasted space. And if we had like a quick guide or something like that, or these are the rules that I regularly need to refer back to. Well, once again, I'm going to have in whatever package and whatever presentation that Catalyst or whatever game company picks, I can't make my own. I can't say, you know what, I'm just going to drop these 500 pages from right. various source books, so we're never going to use them. This is just wasted space that I don't need. Mm-hmm. And so you can pare that down and, and I don't know why I'm so illiterate today, but then position that mm-hmm. into a way that is most pleasant to your perception. <laughs> <Right>. <laughs> Well done. Yeah, I, I just I just went with it because <laughs> it kept fair. happening. So I just <laughs> gave in to the current. Well, and just on the, the like building your own DM screen, I have had game masters who would run like different games frequently enough to want to do that. And I, and one of them had worked in a printing department at a mm-hmm. school. And so he could literally do that in a physical media, yeah. like build his own screen. I, but it's very pretty and it's very nice, but it's also very permanent. And if you yeah. need to look up something new, if you need to add something to it or uh, you don't use rules, it's... I've got another fix for that, but that's a different story. Uh, <laughs> but short short bit, I made a DM screen out of uh, essentially canvas, the like the thin canvases, duct tape and the plastic sheet screens that you could slide pla- you know, yeah, plastic yeah, yeah. sheet protectors mm-hmm. tape those onto the board and it looks professional and looks really nice you can print off whatever dm screens you want and you pull them out and you put them in and i've used that quite a bit to keep up with some of those details because i can easily go ah, i don't need that sheet anymore or i need yep. half the sheet but i've gone to more digital because i'm looking at my monitor screen as more of a dm screen than i am anything else yep. than i have ever thought i would yep. uh, now that i've used it more Permanence is an interesting one, because when I look at the things that I will print out, they change throughout the game. I'm writing things on the sheet of paper. Eventually, I have to go back to my files, update everything, reprint them out. If it's a map, things change on the map of things, and I have to go back and reprint them out. Lose the post-it that I kept the notes because I didn't want to mark up this sheet, and now I don't know where we are. Where if it's digital, (laughs) you can make the change right then and there, and it is in your permanent document. Or even just include the notes on the thing, even if you're not changing the the original, you know, numbers or information, but it's still in the same place and you still mutable and if you're showing it to your players then you update a map and now they can see the difference that just happened because of what they've done yeah general record keeping and visual aids that is a big one for me that's why for the current game i started using one note mm-hmm. because i can keep notes in a much more organized fashion than this yeah. uh, which i realize that's a terrible thing for a podcast <laughs> let, me, yeah. let me explain what i just held up it's, the, it's a portion a paper. <laughs> it's a portion of the game notes from the current campaign we're running and it's just random numbered lists and names and and in years all over the place and if i didn't have this stuff recorded i wouldn't know what half of it means yep. before i had put it into that mm-hmm. one note where it is so much easier to be like, okay, they keep coming back to the star system. I didn't see that coming. Time to make it its own tab. And now I'm going to start putting all the things I have about that system under new okay. tab. It's fast, yeah. it's clean, and it's a whole gracious. When we were playing the Skies of Glass game, 
how many piles of note cards was like <laughs> and maps yeah. and whatever. I had this half inch thick stack of paper mm-hmm. that I was constantly having to page through to find the name of some NPC that we haven't seen in 18 months of real life. Mm-hmm. And but they encountered him back there somewhere and made a connection and they made a whatever and they're calling it in now. Yep. And all of a sudden I'm trying to remember, well, crap, well, who was that person? Where were they located? What were they like? What was any yeah. of this stuff? And yeah, there are cheats around that. Sure. But with technology, it's a lot cleaner and easier to find that than it is to take something like a piece of paper, write stuff down on it, and then either grab a new piece of paper or start trying to erase and rewrite. And what. It's just, it's messy. It's a lengthy process. It just doesn't work. Yeah. Or it doesn't work well, I guess I should right. say. The maintenance it's is just optimized. so much easier. Yeah. On, this is yeah. why one of the things that I am a big fan of is one-party technology, by which I mean that only one party at the table should be piloting mm-hmm. technology, because otherwise mm-hmm. it just becomes a distraction for games and other, you know, whatever, Pat looking at porn, whatever the hell is going on. <laughs> And so I really prefer to have just one person have the technology so you have what it offers without paying all of the heavy prices it brings. And, I, and I'm on the same page there that whatever you bring in, one needs to be vetted, you know, to make sure that it's going to yeah. be worthwhile. And two, everyone at the table has a buy-in on it and it's not overwhelming. Like I, this is one of the reasons why I went with something like Owlbear is it's very much a KISS system. You know, I don't have to think about 3,000 things to manage it. And technically, my players can play using it through their devices that they have. Like, I, I, I've got a player who brings an iPad. I've got one player who brings a laptop. And they do it because they want to play with their character sheets yeah, on those yeah. devices. Okay. As long as they're not a distraction, I don't care if they're at my game. If they become a distraction, I'm going to tell you to put them away. You can right, pen right. and paper, guys. I started out with <laughs> everything written down. When I started gaming, I literally copied books because I couldn't afford books. I have a folder full of tables yeah. of pieces of loose leaf paper. So I know all the, all the tricks of how to handle that. Well, and you just answered all the questions I was going to ask you, which is, yeah. do you allow your players to bring their own technology? I do in this case, but I only allow it for for their character sheets and for them to be able to pull up reference. And then I, I've started to allow them to touch the virtual tabletop a little bit. It has become a distraction. I've had to smack a few hands occasionally. Right. Okay. Because, yeah. Yeah. because yeah. They, there are some fun tools that you can drag and draw and do some sure. things. And there are some permission rules that I can set to lock those things down. Yes, because otherwise... There's a pause in combat while you look up a rule, and pretty soon there's three penises doodling on the map. Yeah, I've had close to that, but not quite penises. But (laughs) uh, no, I've I've had that definitely. My yeah, players are a little it feels uh, inevitable. Yeah. Uh, and it becomes a distraction. And I absolutely agree with that. And some of my players have a little bit of ADD, and I can tell that. But I have, you know, I've made sure that they understand that this is like they understand the value that it brought to the table. When we started out with physical maps, and I brought this in, and they're like, whoa, this makes me engage more because the map is more immersive in some ways. The other thing I've thrown in there is I have the area map of the region that they're in, and I have hidden sections with Fog of War. So as they're exploring this map, they're starting to see, there's the town that we were at last, there's the next town, and we haven't been to this whole zone over here, and there's a road that goes that way. I wonder what's down there. And it's helped them to engage in the world more than me having a physical map where I had to put up sticky notes and cover over sections. And then it's like, oh, that's obviously a thing we we need to look into. But if the entire world is covered in a fog and they're exploring and I'm exposing different little bits, it's been more, oh, we've been there rather than, you know, he's hiding something intentionally. So one thing I'm curious about when I first tried to run off of a laptop, Mm -hmm. the main issue I found in myself and the reason that I haven't gone back to trying to run as a laptop is every time I do it, I find that instead of looking up at my players and making eye contact with them, I am more tempted to be looking at my screen. Well, and Mm. as an addendum to that, like I have had the problem where the entire table is people wanting to run character sheets or everybody has a laptop in front of them and there's that much more distant. Like it it, it feels less like we're playing around Mm -hmm. the same table because everybody has that barrier. Yeah. And me as a GM, I can't help it. And I remember realizing that the game wasn't going like I wanted it to and I was struggling and I wasn't connecting with my players, and I wasn't looking at them enough. Mm-hmm. And at that point, I reached up, closed the laptop lid, put it away, and didn't touch the laptop again for the rest of the session. Because for me, it distracted me as a GM trying to run. Mm-hmm. Have you ever run into that, of the screen catches your eye more than your player's eyes? So I'm big on being present. It's one of the things I like to do in my games anyway. So that just like you like that, 
for me, I've been able to handle the laptop being my replacement for a book. I already have, I mean, I'd already always had three or four books out on the table, flipping through pages and trying to get to things. And if I can keep that as my mental replacement for a book, I'm okay. And if I'm using it or as I'm looking at the next step as my notes instead of my note paper. But I felt like I was looking at my notes and my books just as much as I was my laptop screen. My only distraction is when I get to a point where the technology that I'm trying to use is harder to use than a book. If it's harder to use it than a book, it's out the window. I literally have my books sitting there nearby and I will pull them out and I will flip through them if I can't find something within two seconds on the computer. If it's taking me longer than it would take me to get to it in a book, books are number one. And I'll scratch note the combat and whatnot. I will chicken scratch notes. But when it comes down to the final notes, I will, you know, or bigger notes, I will do that on a physical computer and type it out and whatnot. Uh, But I usually don't do the typing at the table. Yeah, I don't know why, but it seems like for me, a lot of the players I've seen, if they have a physical character sheet, the sheet will be on the table and they won't look at it until they need something. But if it's on a device, they're looking at their sheet more often. Part of it is the devices fall asleep and they want to wake them up. Yeah. Mm -hmm. And but I've seen that as an issue for me of I look up, I want to make eye contact. I don't want to see a head that's looking down at a phone. Even Mm -hmm. if you are looking at your character sheet, you're still looking at your phone. Like yeah, more sure. than looking up at anybody else. Yeah. And I am I know that that is a challenge that I've seen occasionally in my, you know, like I said, to get people yep. to get distracted and try trying to play with the tools that are in front of them. And I'm all about, you know, that I don't mind if they use the digital dice and all that stuff, but I always encourage the physical dice. I also do things like um, when I'm in doing all this technology and whatnot, I, that's why I intentionally brought in the physical minis. You know, I intentionally make sure there's a bridge between those two gaps so that it's not all digital. And so they're always constantly looking at their screens. At that point, we might as well be at home. You know, yeah, yeah. I, yeah. all my players want to be physical. I've actually had a couple of them where they've had, you know, like next game we're going to run. One of the guys is saying, I think I'm going to have to do it remote. And everyone else was like, OK, we like we'll allow it. But we actually everyone was saying we really prefer the physical. They were talking about, well, do we need to do a, you know, an all virtual game for an hour or two just to kind of keep the game going throughout the Christmas season? And everyone else was like, "Mm, no, we actually want to be in the physical. And this is these are all new players. Yeah, and I think it's kind of cool you keep that going because, you know, technology is not an all or nothing. I think when a lot of people think of an electronic gaming system, they imagine there's got to be wall play surface. Your character sheets are digital. Your books are digital. Mm-hmm. Your dice are digital. You they, have to take all of the tech yeah, out of this in order to technology. Precisely. And so pretty soon you just have a collection of half a dozen people sitting around a virtual tabletop or a television on its back. And this might as well mm-hmm. be a land party. And yeah, and everyone's yeah. got their own tablet or phone that has all their stuff on it. Yeah, it starts to feel more like we're just having a land party. We're playing a game and we <laughs> happen to be in the same room. But, I, you know, I, I think even that aside, even if you could actually make that work, and I don't know why you would, but even if you could, that temptation is always there. The device doesn't do one thing. Yep. The device does so many things That's something that I don't think science fiction really got right. Because if you look back at a lot of science fiction that hit before electronics were really genuinely sophisticated, did you notice that all the devices tend to be single purpose? Yep. Mm -hmm. That your devices might be sophisticated, but they are single purpose. Now, I want you to think about all the crap you can do from your phone. Mm -hmm. I mean, obviously, it's a very different sort of situation. You can get calls, you can send text messages, you can go over various apps, mm-hmm. play your games, get on social media, go watch some videos. You can, uh, you're can. you not even intending to engage them, but suddenly someone sends you a message that has something kind of unexpected in it. So you feel that temptation to read it. It's not like you just have this stripped down tablet that does nothing but play this game. Right. You've tried thin clients, even for eBooks and things like that. And that really hasn't even held a, a candle to what we can do today. One of the other things I make sure that everyone does is they put their devices on a do not disturb mode of some kind, including mine, especially oh, mine. Airplane rules, right? Air, either air, not airplane mode because we lose the internet, you know, things oh, like that. But true. you, but yeah. a complete do not disturb of whatever the setting is. I don't. I understand phones, but if you're using a tablet or device, one, I don't want the bleeps. You know, I don't want that to come up. Yeah, and the pop ups yeah. are also uh, distractions. But I very specifically make sure that my devices are on full uh, do not disturb because I will get distracted by my work email popping up all of a sudden, even though I thought I closed the, the you know the device and everything. But I do that especially because I put in I do use audio as well. And I know you guys talked about that last time of how challenging that like putting in music or ambiance music into the game. And I one of the biggest things is 
get that darn thing on complete do not disturb whatever you're putting your audio through because otherwise you will get those distractions so quickly but i use uh that as my first rules like that's you know big thing if you don't have your stuff on do not disturb just like i say cell phones off or whatever you know if you were doing it at a normal table that's a big big help for you know you mentioned dice dan and I hate digital dice. I want to physically roll them. Yeah. <laughs> but for systems that are super complicated and you're trying to figure out what to roll, it is really handy to have just a button on the character sheet. I want to do oh. this attack. I hit this button. Yeah. And it does all of the figuring out what dice need to roll. And it's done. As someone who is a big defender of analog gaming, let me tell you straight up. Every single Fantasy Flight game needs to be electronic. That's, that's <laughs> all of them. Uh, I don't care if it's an RPG, a tabletop game, what it is. All of them well, need to be all, electronic. All of the hieroglyphics need a translator, yeah. and I don't want to learn Precisely. <laughs> the, the Star Wars <laughs> stuff, freaking rolling those hieroglyphic dice. I don't even know what it means. I got three stars, a rainbow. Of, I mean, it's like well, I'm rolling it, Lucky and Charms. It, and they don't have fixed meanings. That means something different based on what I'm rolling than what you're yeah, rolling. Yeah, exactly. Like, and, mm. and so trying to understand precisely how one Egyptian dynasty gave way to another and what bearing that has on the moment. Yeah, it's like this needs to be electronic. Their board games are the same way. Uh, Arkham Horror. Yeah. Holy crap, it takes two hours to set up and two to three hours to clean up. Okay, well, I'm going to sit over here and really enjoy those four hours oh, of setup and cleanup. I, well, and I don't enjoy eight I, hours I, in I between, love playing but, you the know, game. That's, no, I, I like both. I it's love fine. playing the game. I'll, I'll pay the price and I'll enjoy it. But, but that's, I'm a minority which is why we stopped building arkham horror and started building like you know elder elder horror whatever the smaller elder versions Sign. of the game is yeah. Elder Sign. Sign, yeah yeah so before we close this one out let's hit on audio stuff the only time i can remember outside of the lion king game which was a sing-along <laughs> that i used technology in a game was we were playing a game of BattleTech set on Solaris 7, which for those of you not familiar with the BattleTech universe, Solaris 7, it was a Marshall Proving Ground. It's kind of like an old, I don't know why in science fiction planets have one purpose, but and all <laughs> and one biome, according yeah. to George Lucas. And but, there's always an arena world. Yeah, and there's an arena world. In this case, it's Solaris 7. That's the arena world. And they have rules for creating different kind of structures to how you get into the brackets and how you progress through mm-hmm. the brackets and what kind of organization you're a part of and what kind of sponsorships you have. And so you're playing a game of Battletech with lots of role playing intrigue. Sure. Stuff that you normally wouldn't find in Battletech. Plus, you still get big robots beating each other up. And because of the way the story is told, that everyone has their own brand, their own following, their own image, Mm -hmm. I allowed everyone to pick a walk-on song. Okay. (laughs) And and so if a match was starting and it was between them and whatever other character, Mm -hmm. then I'd play just like 15 to 30 seconds of each of their walk-on songs as I Mm -hmm. set the scene of what was starting to occur in that arena before the fight began. Yeah, and that that's a, a great way to pull the characters in and give them that buy-in for the item. I've done a couple of things with mine. I do a lot of ambient audio in the background to, to kind of set the mood. Mm-hmm. I'm playing with a bunch of new players, so I'm trying to really engage them in this world as they're not used to doing a lot of RPing. So I'm bringing in things like, one, I do a lot of audio in the background where it's just general fantasy-style uh, RPG, but... I specifically pick tracks that are not combat tracks or, you know, that just have a general ambient background this noise. This is the overworld that are just, map. Right. Yeah. This is the overworld maps. And I'm very, and I've got a huge playlist of this kind of stuff because what I do during my game prep is I listen to this kind of stuff and I mark the one, I move things out of the, out of those uh, playlists. If it's distracting to me, if I'm working on game prep and it distracts me, that goes into another folder that goes into the combat or the, you know, different category. Um, I did one where I had a, it was a, a kind of a clown horror style game and I was able to bring in those style of music, but I had to very specifically pick those songs. So I do it while I was driving or while I was prepping or while I was doing other things or, you know, I, yes, it was a little bit of work for me, but to be honest, it was kind of fun to listen to this weird music and then go, that works, that doesn't. But it, I have to be very picky about my list. I usually get uh, find some lists that are already existing out there by Spotify and just kind of look around at the lists that exist and then take that and copy it because I'm not going to spend 60 hours sorting through, you know, thousands of songs just to find, you know, the 30 I might use during a session. 
but I, I did the same with some of my audio where I bring in like sound effects or background effects. And I have a couple of tools that I've used to do that. And I can post those in the links. But the biggest thing I did, I learned, I have a bard in my group. Mm -hmm. He's now in charge of a lot of my audio. Mm -hmm. Now I had to work with him and trust him, but I, and I gave him some playlists and things like that to work from to start with. But if he wants to do, if he wanted to bring in a, uh, to handle the audio, absolutely. Guess what? That's your job. You're the bard. You know, you're that kind of character or, you know, and that always doesn't always work in every type of group and every genre, but you could always find that character that fits that or is willing, the player who's willing to be the control of that. So I can kind of focus on running as a GM, but just make sure that they understand if this is distracting, pull that away from them. It's only if this is non distracting and you enjoy it, you know, and so that's as long as it's not distracting from it, I'm okay with it. And I brought in enough ambient music to run through six games probably now over time yeah, I, I think if i was to put a bow on this topic as a whole whichever side you fall on or wherever in the mm -hmm. middle you happen to fall it's be sure you're using the best tool for the job that there, there are going to be advantages and disadvantages in the approach you have a book is less distracting it's a nice physical object gives you a tactile experience but it's going to be a little bit slower to look things up especially if you don't have it really well memorized you bring out a PDF or something like that. Well, now you're going to get all those internal links. You're going to get fonts. You can change it, move things around, do whatever, possibly customize it, depending mm -hmm. on tools you've got access to. And so you get exactly the rule book you want presented in a way that's real quick and easy to search. And, oh, look, there's a message from work. <laughs> and so that's that's where I'd say you got to count your cost. You know, right. can you do a better job of describing a spooky forest? Then you can find a sound effect place that will play it. Mm -hmm. or are you so bad at it you're just setting descriptions not your thing that it would be better to have something technological that does that mm -hmm. you know so, and so i think it's just finding the right tool yeah. for and so I, I hope these episodes if nothing else just gave a little bit of perspective yeah i would say remember know yourself and know your players yeah. for some people maybe the physical book is more distracting because they like looking at the art well and mm -hmm. you know yeah i also in some ways know that this is an episode that we're probably going to look back on with a little bit of grief because <laughs> of the fact that it's one of the few episodes we've recorded that is going to be dated the moment it drops yeah. usually Absolutely. our ideas are fairly agnostic to your system to your setup you know we don't really care it's mm -hmm. just we're trying to tell you how to tell a good story or what at least has worked for us but in this case, I'm sure by the time that people are listening to it, they're aware of technologies we're not, or technologies are going to come out within the next few years that are not currently available. Existing technology is going to improve. As yep. demand goes up, more people are going to wade into that market and create competing tools that might mm -hmm. be better and better to use. And so I, I guess all I can say is don't find a place and hang your hat. Just find the place that works for you. Yep. Well, and I think I think that is the biggest takeaway, especially from the way Caleb has described the way he does things. Is I think it's it's all about balance. It's yeah. about yeah. what is the balance between this technology is cool and it works really well, and also this is how I make it fit in with the rest of the field that I want. And the other big thing I recommend after doing a lot of this myself and figuring it out and whatnot is one is make sure that you test the technology well before you run into the game. That really makes a big difference. And the second thing is to not look for the flashiest possible thing would find something that works for you, but doesn't require you to spend 30 hours of time setting it up and getting it all the way you want it. Because there's always, there's hundreds of different tools out there that do the same job, just do it in different levels. So find things that work for you. And if it doesn't work for you, go to the next thing. And it's okay to, to not buy into one too heavily. All right. I think so. we're going to wrap this one up. Check the show notes for a few different links to some things. And uh, some of the tools we talked about and well, some of the technologies we referenced, I'll dig those up. And other than that, have a great week and great games, and we will catch you next time. This has been a production of Fear the Boot, copyright 2024. Listeners are free to use this episode in a non-commercial endeavor, so long as credit is provided to feartheboot.com. You can find previous episodes and other resources at feartheboot.com. If you wish to support this show and its related endeavors, you can do so at patreon.com slash fear the boot.